Hi, I'm David. Uh, I thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I'm here to, to introduce the group from IIT that's going to be presenting. Um, I've lived a lot of different places in the last couple of years, Washington DC, the Bay Area, now back in Chicago, and the best data scene, I think, in the country is right here. Um, and it's because of all of you. Um, and there's a really strong ecosystem here in Chicago. Um, IIT, Dr. Robert Ellis and his students are an important part of that ecosystem. I'm a journalist. Um, I think we also have a role to play in that ecosystem and you'll see some of that tonight. Uh, some of uh, Dr. Ellis' students actually use data that, that uh, we, we uh, obtained and, and um, released in the course of reporting about ticket debt. You'll be hearing about potholes tonight, another important open data set. Um, and I just want to, you know, I just want to say it's really, really cool that you're all out here to support these students. Um, I think students engaging with this material um, is really incredible. I got to uh, speak to those students um, and present, present some of our work to them a couple months ago. They're really smart, they're really engaged, um, they're really team oriented, and uh, I just want to give them a huge round of applause. Uh, so, uh, I'm presenting up here for our team P++, but this isn't a one-person effort, so I want to just uh, quickly thank my team members, Sarbani, Adriana, and Anna for all their help in this project, and a quick shout out to Chicago 311 for all their open data sets, which made this project possible. Um, so we had a four-part approach to our project, which uh, first part was data analysis uh, to find patterns in the pothole data set. Second, create a graph of Ward 19's drivable street network, place facilities using the capacitated facility location problem, and then use the traveling salesman algorithm to find the best route to fill potholes. Um, there are two sh uh, charts on this slide. On the, I guess it is your left, is a graph of pothole concentration by ward. Darker colors, of course, are the highest concentration. And on your right is a graph of Ward 19's potholes mapped to the nearest street intersection. Uh, we used a similar approach to the graph on the right in that we uh, mapped all of our potholes to the nearest uh, street intersection. So in the graph, it would be uh, the nodes. Uh, I will go back to the slide at... Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not used to presenting. Uh, but this is a learning experience, right? So, <laughs> um, here we mapped the number of, here we graphed the number of service requests for potholes um, to the number of potholes that are actually filled. You'll notice that the number of potholes that are uh, put in through the service requests are much, much lower than the numbers of potholes that are actually serviced. Uh, this combined with the fact that there's only a moderate uh, moderate positive correlation between the two uh, led us to use the uh, s data set of potholes that have actually been filled. Um, moving on to our facility placement, uh, we randomly selected 14 facilities on Ward 19, in Ward 19, and then ran an, uh, the capacitated facility algorithm in order to determine which of these facilities are actually needed in order to make, this make the pothole filler run optimally. So we play, ended up placing four facilities at the um, intersections that are listed up on the slide. Um, and this would cost the city of Chicago $1.7 million. And then the result of our routing algorithm uh, using the tra traveling salesman approach uh, is in this video. So while the video is playing, you'll notice that sometimes the, uh, the pothole filler goes back into streets that it's already covered. This might not be the most efficient. So in post-processing, what we would do to tackle this issue is use the Chinese Postman 
algorithm on the edges of the network and a genetic algorithm to improve our traveling salesman algorithm results. Test? Okay. So, um, hello everybody. My name is Eric Antonia. Um, this is Autonomous Pothole Feeling, and my teammates were um, Ekram G and Luke Logan, and this project was advised by Dr. Robert Ellis over at IIT. So, um, pothole damage costs um, United States drivers over $3 billion per year. Uh, this number was quoted by AAA. Um, so, statement of the problem. So, to contract the pothole epidemic, um, autonomous vehicles are going to be used ultimately to fill all these potholes, right? I mean, we already have major companies with a lot of resources and a lot of really smart people working on uh, making self-driving cars, so there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to have these vehicles also um, work on our potholes for public service. So if you look at the potholes reported by year, where each line is um, a month, uh, and on the bottom you have the year, and then on the left axis, on the Y axis, you have um, the actual number of potholes. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a spike in 2014, right? So what's so special about 2014? Um, the third highest snowfall and the third coldest winter in Chicago history was in 2014. And it's not just that there was a lot of snow that year. It's that there's this, um, like, consistent snowfall um, over a long period of time that causes potholes. And then in combination with a lot of traffic and heavy vehicles, you get a lot of potholes. Right, so um, where are the potholes in Chicago? So you can see on the heat map here, um, I mean, there's a lot um, near the loop, obviously where we are, but there's also a lot of potholes like by highway exits, and there's also a lot of potholes where there tend to be like a lot of heavy vehicles, like I mentioned. So places where there tend to be like bus stops and places where um, kind of, I mean, industrial areas, like I mentioned already. And if you look at the heat map, the potholes are kind of really, really scattered um, if you look at the top here, this part right here, where I-90 is, um, so that's kind of curious, right? I mean, obviously, like I mentioned, they're, they're by these, these highway exits. But another reason is pothole politics. So residential areas are really not a priority for CDOT when they're filling potholes and when they're deciding which potholes get filled. Um, so the potholes that are nearest to the loop and the potholes that actually get you to a highway are, have the highest priority, but the potholes that are like in the back alley, like behind your house aren't really a priority for CDOT when they're planning which potholes get filled. So, I mean, we wanted to f like find out which wards get their potholes filled the quickest, right? So this is mean time to fill in days by ward. So you can see it's kind of like a north side, south side issue. Um, the more yellow the ward, the longer it takes to fill. So you can see that this yellow ward up here takes nearly like more than 55 days to get their potholes filled. Meanwhile, if we zoom in a little bit, um, the ward we're in right now, ward 42, takes about two weeks to get all their potholes filled. Meanwhile, they have like the largest concentration of population in Chicago. Um, and then, so another thing we did is we made um, a machine learning algorithm to try and predict like how many potholes are there gonna be in a ward in a given year. So we used features like the amount of rain and the amount of snow, the amount of cold days that were, um, that happened that year. And it does a pretty good job, but I mean, there's a lack of data. Um, there's a lack, I mean, not a lack of data, but there's a lack of granular weather data and a lack of granular traffic data in Chicago. Um, and yeah, the most important features that were identified by the regressor were the number of cold days that year and the amount of rain that year. And then, so if we look at the routing algorithm we developed, this is over six hours in Ward 41. So you can see we can route 41 potholes in six hours. And I mean, if, if you think about it, I mean, you're routing 41 potholes and nobody's involved and nobody has to actually do anything, right? Um, I mean, and we can talk about the details in the algorithm if you come to our longer talk. And so what if we can have round the clock pothole filling with uh, this autonomous pothole filler? So same word, if we run it for 24 hours, we can fill 181 potholes in those 24 hours where the, where the red markers are potholes and the green is the start and stop location. Um, so uh, that's a pretty good amount, right? But I mean, oh, oh, I cut it out, but I mean, it, d depending on the, the potholes and the traffic and everything, it could be like a little lower, a little higher, but yeah, but that's the gist of it. It wouldn't be a complete presentation about civic technology if we didn't take time to talk about the ethical implications of this work. So imagine that we're all going to stare into one big deep pothole 
and reflect on the implications of this kind of work. Hopefully you know by now that IIT students and professors are very talented when it comes to applied mathematics and engineering. But you may not know that IIT is also home to the world's largest library of ethics codes. Throughout the Math 497 course, all of the teams worked on ethical case studies. And if you ask them, they also not only spent a lot of time programming, but a lot of time writing about the results and the potential risks of their work. Uh, my name is Winesh, and I'm a fourth year computer science student. I taught a high school class called Ethical Machine Learning. And Dr. Ellis asked me to come and sit down with both of the pothole teams to discuss some of the ethical topics that came up as they worked on their project. Uh, and we chose one of those topics to do a participatory ethics exercise today with all of you. Because ethics is supposed to be something that all people can engage in, not just policymakers or computer scientists. As we discussed the potential ethical implications of this work, many really interesting and rich issues came up. Uh, it's known, as you heard from Chai Hack Knight just a few weeks ago, that any code or software used in a civic service is now a form of policy. And so the algorithms that guide the placement of these facilities or the self-driving pothole filling robots are also, in a way, policy mediums. We also talked about the reporting bias that comes and how these potholes are submitted to the city and potentially disparities across different neighborhoods and types of people. But the biggest ethical elephant in the room had to do with automation. As these pothole filling robots become more and more practical, does any group have a moral obligation to the pothole filling employees who might be displaced by that technology? And this is a messy ethical question. And you could replace the city's Department of Transportation with any other actor. The researchers who design these algorithms, the businesses that currently offer pothole filling services, or even citizens who decide whether or not to report issues they see in their communities. To go at a, approach a question like this, we need to pick the right ethical frame. Lots of ethicists who consult researchers or industry companies on how to approach those challenges have to be patient with people who may not have studied all of the ethical theories. So today, we're going to do an activity with one ethical frame that I think will help us view this question productively. So this comes from the field of deontological ethics, which has to do with what kinds of duties do people have to each other and to other parts of society. You may have heard of ethicists like Kant or others in that field, but today we'll focus on W.D. Ross a British ethicist who specifically asked about duties and obligations. Ross proposed seven prima facie duties. They're called prima facie because it means a first draft. Duties that are correct until proven otherwise. Ross admits that these aren't the only, the only seven duties, but he offered them as a first try. And if any of these duties is the only duty that occurs in a situation, then Ross reasons that it must be your moral obligation to fulfill it. Things get murky once more than one of these obligations is relevant to the situation. The seven prima facie duties that Ross suggests are fidelity, a duty to keep promises or agreements that you've made, reparation, a duty to make up for prior wrongful acts, even if they are not your own, gratitude, to be grateful for others' acts of kindness, justice, to prevent or correct mismatches of merit and pleasure, or benefit, beneficence, to improve the condition of others, self-improvement, to improve one's own condition through education or practice, and non-maleficence, to not harm others. Ethicists who work with researchers and industry try to take these ethical ideas and turn them into simple reflective tests. So here is what I'm calling the prima facie test. First, of these seven duties, do any of them intersect or come into conflict if the city of Chicago is deciding whether or not to adopt self-driving pothole, self pothole filling robots? So take a look at these seven duties and discuss with your neighbors, is it possible that multiple of these apply to the pothole filling robots and the workers that they might displace? So now, now that you've discussed some of the duties that Ross proposes, even he admits that those are not the only duties that could exist. And in fact, he says the only way to decide between them 
is to get ready for this. Reflect thoughtfully until you can reflect no longer. <laughs> so we will reflect more thoughtfully and ask, are there any other kinds of ethical duties or obligations that are not included on this list? Is there something not captured by one of these categories that you think is an important part of the social contract between the Department of Transportation, the citizens, and its pothole workers? Out of all seven duties that you saw proposed by Ross, and any others that your group discussed, which of those is the most important duty that the city has in this scenario? Did anybody have an interesting discussion throughout this activity they want to share with the whole group? Raise your hand and I'll come find you. Our group came up with a really just interesting idea. Um, so in order to fill potholes, um, there has to be some sort of monitoring system that determines where the potholes are and which ones are bad and how much needs to be filled and everything like that, which means that there's going to be cameras, which means that there's going to be some level of monitoring on streets and how and where does that end and how do we notify people and what if there's something that's seen that's not supposed to be seen and things like that and where do we kind of where does Google step in kind of thing yeah definitely a very relevant worry any other groups want to share something they discussed or something one of their neighbors brought up we didn't come to a shared conclusion but I really like interpreting um, that justice through an equity lens, thinking about uh, racial and economic equity and how potholes are filled, but also how potholes are recorded, which you alluded to early when you were talking about ethics, um, how reports happen and how service is targeted based on not only reports, but what we know about existing conditions and how reports are formed and what groups may or may not report in different ways. What was, if I can ask, what was something your group didn't agree on? I wish they would do all of them. Um, I think for us, we all kind of picked one. Mine was Fidelity, Soren's was Justice. Scott, I think yours was the Beneficence. I think they all sort of have a similar meaning where you should be helping the citizens with things. And for me, the Fidelity is if like someone gets elected on promises that they're going to improve like infrastructure and road work. Um, and if our taxes are going to go towards infrastructure and road work, they should keep that promise up. Whereas Soren's was sort of an equity stance, which he talked about. Um, and yours is more of like the social, social sort of justice way that governments can work for their people. We also talked a little bit about ordering and how it doesn't seem like there's a clear like, like all right, first you start here and then these other ones follow from it. And depending on which one you emphasize the most, uh, you can have very different outcomes. The city, we talked about how it seems like the city's primary goal should be to improve the condition of others. Uh, we have two city employees in our group and I asked them if that is uh, how they operated. They both seemed, <laughs> Joel, Joel just nodded yes. Um, but then it seems like oftentimes as systems kind of exist to benefit themselves and so, once you mix up the idea that once people are operating within a system, they are they tend to prioritize their improving their own condition. So you often have an interesting conflict with uh, what does it mean for an individual to benefit from a system, especially an individual operating within the system of the city versus having a system continue to try to benefit the city as a whole. I don't know if that make, made any sense. Uh, we saw the fr initial framing of the question of uh, CDOT's responsibility to to the pothole filling employees as a little narrow, that CDOT has moral obligations to a variety of groups, including, including people in Chicago, and that in we'd have to we should consider the concerns of those stakeholders as well. So one one potential thing we brought up is that uh, CDOT is not exactly lacking for things that were for workers to do and that using the workers who were replaced by the pothole filling robots to do additional tasks that you know make Chicago function more efficiently it would both satisfy the obligation the beneficence obligation to the replaced workers and also the beneficence obligation of CDOT 
to Chicagoans as well. Yeah, as our discussion kind of evolved from uh, just looking at the moral obligation to workers to expanding to what would go on as the new processes got implemented, uh, one of the interesting questions that I wanted to share with the group was we kind of started talking about how do you measure the value of a new program? So if that's just purely utilitarian, like the more people you help, the better, or is it a value based on like the number of foot traffic or car traffic, um, or do you have to do that in a per capita sense or even it out among the wards? Like how do you start measuring the value? And we didn't come up with a striking answer, but that was one of the questions we thought would be interesting um, as these are explored. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to share? So to wrap up, I do want to talk about the utilitarianism that I heard from a number of groups say, well, how do we know how things will turn out for the workers or how things will turn out for different communities in Chicago and fixing their potholes and other elements of the roads? Ross's work and the idea of these moral obligations fits into a system called deontological ethics. It's one of the three main groups of Western ethics. There's also virtue ethics, which focuses on how do we choose the right thing based on the kind of person we want to be, and consequentialist ethics, which are focused on how do we judge the potential consequences of our actions. Most utilitarian thought falls into consequentialism. How do we determine how much good or how much bad will arise from the choices that we make? And the reason that I chose to use a deontological frame is because the utility and the consequences are very natural for a lot of us in the civic tech community. If you're a policymaker, if you're an engineer, if you're a journalist, you have a lot of practice finding raw hard numbers, comparing and contrasting systems, looking at how things change over time and how different groups are impacted. But this is a very different, messy kind of ethical thinking if you come from that lens. The main goal of deontological ethics is to look at not just the consequences of your action, but your intentions and your motivations. It's possible to avoid all of the consequences that legal issues care about and sneak under the hood with unethical behavior. Deontological ethics also tries to form these universal rules that should apply to everybody. Whereas consequentialism can allow certain people to, again, escape this ethical guise because they're not causing too much harm. Of course, it's very difficult to engage in these discussions because often these duties and rules conflict with each other. And the most interesting part of all of it is that if you are a good ethical person, according to a lot of these moral obligation philosophies, you will avoid harm in the world, but you may also reduce the amount of good that's created. And whether the people advocating for self-driving, pothole-filling robots are researchers, policymakers, or wealthy technological companies, you want to consider not just the consequences and the outcomes of their work, but also what their motivations are and whether or not this will help make the social contract of that ecosystem continue to be ethical. So thanks for participating, and uh, we'll bring the teams back up to ask questions. You kind of cover this, but really basic question. How are, how do potholes like form? Like, <laughs> like where do they come from? Uh, you mean like the... Like, is it like there's like soft ground underneath and like stuff just like comes down or is it just like because like when the snow melts and like heat expands, it just forms cracks and then like when the snow blower goes over, it just like causes right. more cracks. Like, right, right, how right. Do they so um, this isn't actually something we... I'm drawing on like my, my middle school science class knowledge okay, right great. here. But I think Same what happens place. is you start with the crack, right? So the asphalt cracks, um, and in the winter it rains, whatever, whatever. And this water seeps down into this crack, and when the water freezes, it actually expands in the crack. So over time, after this happens a lot, it turns into like, like the bottom, it'll, it'll crack a bit more, and it'll crack it on another place, and then like the top comes off, and then it's eventually it's like this big gaping hole in the ground. Okay. That makes sense. My group has a question, which is, are pothole filling robots currently a thing in Chicago or anywhere? To the best of my knowledge, no, but they are being worked on. I know that our uh, robotics professor, I believe, is working on it right now. 
So the University of Leeds has a drone that will swoop in and fill a small pothole that currently exists. Winesh briefly mentioned differences in reporting across different areas of the city. This is pretty common with different civic data sets, especially based on uh, reports from residents of a city, where residents in areas of a city that feel more politically empowered or who have more political power are more likely to report things because they believe that more will come of their reports. Did you discuss that pretty thoroughly during the project? And what were some of the thoughts that you had around that in feeding data that could be biased in that way into a system to plan pothole filling? Um, so when I was uh, looking through the two data sets, the service requests and the number of potholes that have actually been filled, um, it seems that uh, in Ward 19 in particular, there was a low number of requests, even though it has one of the highest, I believe the third highest number of pothole um, occurrences in Chicago. So I, th I thought it could have been due to a combination of factors. Ward 19 is a primarily white ward. Um, I believe around 63% of its residents are white. Um, and it is uh, slightly um, higher income than most wards. Uh, so you would think that maybe with these statistics that it would have pretty good reporting of potholes from its citizens. But on the other hand, we're not sure how well the reporting system is actually advertised within the city of Chicago. I think, and I might be have actually dreamed this, but I think <laughs> <laughs> that I had uh, seen on one of the highways I was driving on like a, like a billboard that said like, do you, if you want to report potholes, you can go here and report a pothole. Um, not everyone in the city of Chicago even has a car. Some of them just might use CTA. So uh, there's cer certainly no like television ads about it. Uh, so part of it is a lack of maybe knowledge that such a system exists. And part of it is maybe like, how, how annoyed do you have to be by a pothole before you're like, maybe I should report this. <laughs> um, and also uh, don't ignore the people in the back. There's a couple questions. <laughs> Sorry, I have a question about sort of the how. Um, so for the process of the coming up with the algorithm, I'm wondering how you did the weighting of like how much does it cost to drive one block versus how much does it cause, uh, cost to like stay at a good pothole and fill it up? Like what was the process for coming up with that? Uh, so uh, we were going to cover this more in our breakout section, session, but I don't mind going over it now. Uh, we used the cost of going from a facility to any... Um, we Well, first of all, we structured our algorithm such that it would travel from a facility which is at an intersection to another intersection. So in the graph, it would be from a node to a node. Um, so we... Uh, used our uh, weighted nodes in, a, in our algorithm. And the weights were, uh, it would have been the distance from the facility times the cost of gas to actually get there, plus um, depreciation of the vehicle to, or the pothole filler to actually um, visit that node over the year. Um, we chose not to use the materials or the cost of materials to actually fill the potholes because we wanted the requirement to be such that all potholes would be filled regardless of whatever the co cost is to travel there. Um, so that was would have been consistent. So the way we did it was a little bit different. So essentially we had an optimization problem. We computed the amount of time it takes to travel a block. So let me rephrase this. We divided the graph of a ward into a bunch of blocks, and then we go to a certain subset of those blocks. We compute the time it takes to travel those blocks. We know the, we know the distance, the total distance the block is, the total amount of length, and we approximate that by saying the, war the robot can travel a certain speed. So distance divided by speed is time. And essentially we said, select as many blocks as possible with as many potholes as possible under the constraint that the robot is not outside longer than this amount of time. 
All right, we've got a question from the doc. Um, the map of Chicago is surprising. It isn't often that the data suggests the south side is getting better service. Why is that? Is a random pothole on the south side on average filled more quickly than one on the north side? Or maybe, or is there some way that it could be a reporting issue? Ha and has somebody done a pothole sample Sorry, has anybody done pothole sampling so that there's an unbiased sample? Um, right, so that's something that we actually thought about when uh, I made that plot, right? So, I mean, how do you explain that? So there aren't that many, I mean, if you look at that population, oh, I mean, I don't have the slides anymore, but um, there are a lot less people who live on the south side, so it's possible that there are, there are actually a lot less people on the south side, but it's also possible that there's a lot less people on the south side and there's also a lot of, a lot less people on the south side who actually report potholes, and that kind of goes back to what Soren said. So, I mean, that's something to take into consideration, but that's not necessarily something that we actually took into account when we did the, when we made those maps. So I made a similar map to this, just with Median, and posted on Twitter, and somebody suggested that the pothole guys, the pothole fillers live in Bridgeport and kind of work out from there, since it's centered around Bridgeport and the loop, um, which might be a bit off the cuff, but I think that there are there may be like routing concerns or also that also what you mentioned with highways that there might be concentration around highway exits and there are the highways that go through the south side. Um, yeah, I don't really have. Oh wait, I do actually have another question. Um, on the, you were talking about with the algorithm that like picks blocks and says goes to the maximum number of blocks. Did you consider that if you're always if you're going to the most accessible blocks, that there they'll disadvantage blocks that might just be farther away and not get potholes filled. And is there kind of a like a cycling schedule to make sure that there's not complete coverage? Um, so the way I described this algorithm wasn't 100 percent. That wasn't exactly what our algorithm does. It's we have more details in our other in our breakout session, but it's a statistic. We compute a statistic for each block based on the priority of visiting that block, the amount of time it takes since it's been potholes. OK, let me restart that. It's a statistic based on the priority of visiting that block, the amount of time since the last pothole on that block was filled, and the distance that block is from the starting point of the robot. But I tried to make it so the distance factor isn't huge. So is there a way of measuring or thinking about how onerous a pothole is? How, how, how much it interferes with, say, emergency vehicles or commercial traffic or residential traffic? Is there a way of understanding which potholes are, are causing the most problems? So to the best of my knowledge, the only way that I know of how to do that with the data that we currently have is by saying that highways are more important, and those would be typically where vehicles are traveling that are servicing emergencies. Um, there were, there are current ways to identify what the severity of a pothole using machine learning, but that requires you to have an image of the pothole, and those can determine like, okay, this pothole is huge. You need to fill this pretty quickly, or else it's going to be a really big problem. But with the data we currently have, it would, it would just be an estimate of how long since the pothole has been filled and where the pothole is located. All right. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to tell Eads, um, I, I mean, if you, I mean, from the data that we do actually have, you could say that if a pothole gets reported like maybe more than one time, we can say like this is the severity of the pothole. So like if it's a really, really bad pothole, there's probably gonna be like more than one person who reports this. We can just like count the duplicates or something and say like this is the se severance of the pothole. Se severeness, whatever. <laughs> Severity, yeah. All right, I think that's all the time we've got for questions. So give it up one more time for...